Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today as we launch our Night Sky Explorer series. So first of all, who is us? We are Voyagers National Park Association. We're a charitable organization and the official friends group of Voyagers National Park. So this is our first online live event and we appreciate your patience as we navigate tonight's event. We just want to start with a couple notes to orient everyone. First, if you're watching via Zoom, um, note that we've muted all of the viewers and asked you to turn off your video. Second, keep an eye on the chat window, whether you're on Facebook or Zoom, we'll be posting links to different downloads for sky watching. And last, if you have any questions for Astro Bob as we go along, go ahead and post them in the Zoom chat or on Facebook Live. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. In the far north of Minnesota, under some of America's darkest, most awe-inspiring skies, Voyagers National Park beckons you to explore the night skies. Pristine dark skies have mostly disappeared from the earth, but the National Park Service is working to preserve Voyager's night skies and applying for International Dark Sky Association Certified Dark Sky Park. With funding from the Voyager's National Park Association, the NPS is installing new fixtures to help reduce light pollution in the park and is bringing dark skies to you. Now, as we celebrate Voyagers becoming a dark sky park, we'd like to thank Starry Skies Lake Superior for connecting us to Astro Bob King. Bob fell in love with the night sky and astronomy when he was just a kid, and you'll see tonight that how much he really loves to share his passion with people of all ages. He was a photographer and photo editor at the Duluth News Tribune for 39 years before retiring in 2018 and also taught at UMD Planetarium for many years and has written a number of books. His first two describe the joys of sky watching while the latest one, Urban Legends of Space, examines science versus pseudoscience in astronomy. Now, please welcome Astro Bob. Hi everybody, good to see you all. Uh, this is my first virtual experience, so uh, I know you're out there and I can kind of picture you. I know why you're here because you want to learn a little bit more about the night sky. Uh, we're all feeling a little hemmed in, I think, because of COVID-19. And one of the things about the sky that's so wonderful is that, provided it's clear or partly cloudy, you can go out and look up. There's this great wild place up above our heads. To me, it has always been the greatest wilderness. One of the reasons I live in Duluth is because we have dark skies, relatively dark skies, and I can access that sky pretty frequently. So I, we're gonna spend some time uh, under the sky, relaxing, and we're also going to learn a few things about the sky that will help enhance that experience so we can enjoy it even more. I find a little bit of information helps us to appreciate the sights that much more. Uh, one of the first things you'll want to know or learn if you're a sky watcher is your directions. I mean, it sounds super simple, directions, north, south, east, west. But if you, have, if you know your directions and how to find them wherever you're at, then you're oriented and you know how to use a star map. It's the basis for a star map. So directions, of course, one great way to do it uh, is to use a compass. I've got this one here. Many of you have a compass, no doubt. It's probably stuck in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> So that's one easy way. Um, another way is to use your phone. iPhones, for instance, if you own one of those, they have a built-in compass app. You can just look under settings and then you'll see under settings your different software that's installed. Comes with it, wonderful. Uh, Android phones, most of them do not have the compass app, but you can Google Android compass app and then there are several free programs that make that available. Or when all of that fails, you can use your body and what nature gave us. You can use the sun. And as you know, if I'm looking at you now, if, if I'm looking at you and you are the sun and the sun is setting, 
I'm facing in the west direction, right? And so my back, which is opposite the west, is facing to the east. My left hand points to the north, and my right hand points south. So that's a general way to find your direction, just to kind of keep an eye where the sun is. The sun is almost due west at this time of year, about two hours before it sets, and two hours after it rises. Once you do know your directions, you're basically oriented, okay? With that, I'm gonna show you one of the funnest things you can use. Maybe some of you have these at home. It's called a planisphere. Look at this monster. Wow, this is, this is the nicest planisphere I've ever come across. It's called the Levy planisphere, L-E-V-Y, Guide to the Stars. And what it does, what any planisphere does, is it takes the dome of the sky above you and it basically scrunches it and flattens it all into an oval or a circle. Here we have the entire sky right there in that circle that's visible this evening. Uh, planispheres are very fun because you can look at the sky at any time, at any date of the year, just by dialing it in. For instance, here, the inner wheel, which shows the time on the clock, you can see seven, eight, nine, and so on, you match the inner wheel with the outer wheel, which shows the date on the calendar. So for instance, if we want to look to see what's happening in the sky tonight, we would dial 9 p.m. right on top of April the 21st. There we go, right there. And then this would be a representation of the sky. On a planisphere, since it's crushing a three-dimensional dome into a two-dimensional surface, the center of your planisphere right there, that's the overhead point in the sky. The outline right here, that is the horizon. So if something is near the top of the sky, you're gonna be looking up. Center of the map, you're gonna be looking up. Something close to the edge of the oval means you're gonna be looking very low above the horizon. And if it's halfway between the edge and the center, then it's about halfway up in the sky. You'll notice this has got a cool little rivet right there. Some of you might be able to guess what that is. That's the North Star at that spot. Uh, it stays in one place because the Earth's axis always points towards Polaris, the North Star. So that's basically how a planisphere works. Um, let me show you just a couple more steps. When you look at it straight on, you'll notice directions on the planisphere. There's south at the bottom, okay? Over here we have west, up on the top is north, and over on this side is east. To use this, you first face south. We'll start with south. And since you know where south is because you've learned your directions, when you face south this time of year, you're going to see these constellation groups in front of you. Next, you pivot yourself, you're outside now, picture, and you turn a quarter turn to the right. And when you do, you are facing to the west, and you're viewing the western sky. If you want to view the northern sky, you turn the whole thing upside down, you pivot one more quarter turn so that you face to the north, and then you see the northern stars. And finally, we make one final quarter turn in our circle. We put east on the bottom of the planisphere, and these are the stars that you would see. So that's basically how one of these works. We'll have a link for you if you'd like to buy one. Here's another version, a smaller version of the planisphere. This is called the Phillips planisphere. It does the exact same thing. I want to use this to demonstrate something that you'll find handy if you're out under the stars. Maybe some of you already have one of these little guys. It's a little red flashlight, you see that? Our eyes are not so sensitive to red light. Because of that, it's handy to use. It doesn't blind us. It takes time to get your night vision when you're out under a dark sky. You don't wanna spoil it with turning out a big bright flashlight to look at a star map. So instead you get a red light, and the red light is super handy because our eyes are less sensitive to red. So it preserves what we call our night vision. So that's two little things that you might want to acquire. But you know what? You don't actually have to buy a planisphere. Not for the moment. There's lots of ways. You can go online and check it out. 
If you go to, and I've got the website here, but it'll also be on the Voyager site, you'll see that at skymaps.com, you can print out a monthly, there we go, a monthly evening star map. This is very similar to a planisphere, isn't it? Except that it's a circle and it only shows the sky for the month of April. So just a month at a time. So you go back each month and print out a copy. Once again, the center of the map is the overhead point. The outside of the circle, that area is the horizon. Otherwise, it's, it's identical to a planisphere and it is free. Just go to skymaps.com. We're gonna use I'm gonna show you kind of up close right now how to use that map in a little more detail so that when you do print out a copy in your free time, uh, you'll be able to go out on the next clear night and use it and see if you can find some new constellations. That's kind of the goal here. You might be familiar with the Big Dipper or maybe the Belt of Orion, but my gosh, there's so many other great star groups up there uh, that I'd love for you to get to know, like the constellation of oh, Virgo or Leo or some of the other wonderful fall and spring and summer constellations. So we're just gonna switch over right now, and I'm gonna bring you to some maps. All right, I hope you can all see that. What I've done is I've just taken a picture of that sky map, and I've divided it into sections, south, west, north, and east. Here, we're facing to the south, if you can see that, and of course, we are turning ourselves to face south at the same time. When we do, closer to the horizon, there's a really neat little constellation. One of my favorites, this is called Corvus the Crow. It's not super bright, but it is a very, pardon me, I skipped. Let's go back. Not very bright, but it's really compact and it'll stand out for you. That little trapezoid is a crow. And that's there in the southern sky about 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock in the evening on late April nights. Way above it, you're going to see a bright star at the bottom of what looks like a backwards question mark. This bright star is Regulus. The question mark is part of Leo the lion. That's actually the head of the lion. And it connects back to three stars that form the tail of the lion. And then that together, can you see it? Picture it. A reclining lion, like at a zoo that you might see, resting on a hot afternoon. So Corvus the crow and Leo the lion. Now remember on the map I just showed you, you just turn the map so that west is on the bottom, right down here. You pivot so that you face the western direction. And look, oh, there's our old friend Orion right there. Look at the belt of Orion. My gosh, you have to get out early if you want to see the belt of Orion because he's going down settling into the west, while new spring constellations come up in the eastern sky. To the right of Orion, the most prominent thing in the evening sky right now, spectacular to see, is the planet Venus. If you've seen a brilliant object that you may have thought was a UFO, and it just sat there forever, that's Venus, uh, the planet that comes closest to the Earth and the brightest of all the planets. Now we pivot again, a quarter turn, and we turn the map so that we can read the word north on the bottom. And of course, no big surprise, way at the top of the sky, there's the Big Dipper. Very nice. Now, from the Dipper, we can get to the North Star if we shoot an arrow through the two end stars, which are called the pointers, which makes sense. The two pointer stars until we come to Polaris. There it is, the North Star, that pivotal star in the northern sky stays in that same spot as the Earth rotates because our north polar axis points straight at it. And it's always a perfect indicator for north. Now the Little Dipper branches off from Polaris this way. You see that? So that the Little Bowl faces the Big Bowl. In fact, they say that the water carried here in the Big Dipper drips or falls right down there into the Little Dipper. So they face one another. This constellation or figure of a constellation called an asterism, this constellation is very bright, whereas this one is much fainter. But Polaris itself is about as bright as the stars of the Big Dipper. Some people have heard, or maybe you've heard, that uh, Polaris is one of the brightest stars in the sky. It is not. It's actually just as bright as the Dipper star. I think it gets that uh, 
fame because of its special position in the sky. Let's wrap up here with east. There's east on the bottom. You've turned now so that you've almost completed the circle. And wow, there is a fantastic bright orange star in the eastern sky about 9 o'clock, 9.30, once it gets dark out. That star is Arcturus. And Arcturus heads up a constellation with a weird sounding name called Boötes. There it is right there, Boötes. I don't care if you call it Boots, I won't tell anybody, but it's actually Boötes. So Boötes looks kind of like an ice cream cone on its side. Let me show you. Here's the bottom of the cone, one of those sugar cones. That's the point. Up here is one of the sides. Here's the other side. Can you see that? And then on top, we have the ice cream. It looks like an extra large scoop, just the way I like my ice cream cones. Directly below Boötes is a mouthful of a constellation in a most beautiful shape, like a little horseshoe, called Corona Borealis. Corona Borealis is called the Northern Crown. And you can see it does kind of look like a crown. Its brightest star is a little gem of a thing called Gemma. So look east, you'll see Arcturus, Corona Borealis, Gemma, and so on. And you can get all this information on that map that you can print out for free. That map also includes a list of events on the other side uh, that happened during the month that you can see with the naked eye. So it's very helpful in that regard. Let me show you something else. Now look at how pretty this is. This is another way of viewing the sky. It's sort of a very fancy planisphere but it's with software. This is called Stellarium, and we'll talk a little bit more about Stellarium next week. With Stellarium, you can create a more natural sky right on your computer and look far into the future or into the past and see the constellations as they were and will be. Here we are looking west. Some things look familiar already. Indeed, there's Venus, there's Orion's Belt, Directly below Venus, you're going to see a little V-shaped group of stars headed up by a bright orange star called Aldebaran. This is a star cluster called the Hyades. To the right of the Hyades is a more familiar star cluster called the Pleiades. I love that they rhyme, Hyades and Pleiades. Another name for the Pleiades is the Seven Sisters. So that might be more familiar to you. Here they are through a small telescope. My gosh, what a beautiful sight. You know, to me, one of the most spectacular sights in the heavens. It doesn't require a telescope. It is this star cluster, the Pleiades, through a pair of binoculars. If you have a pair of binoculars, my gosh, point them there as soon as you can, or you'll have to wait until the fall and the Pleiades return in the morning sky and at night. But it's still up. Uh, the Pleiades is a star cluster. They were all born together from the same cloud of gas and dust. And it's about 444 light years from the Earth. Here's the northern sky. By now, you're kind of familiar. You're like, oh, yeah, I know. The Big Dipper's way up at the top of the sky. Here are the pointer stars taking you down to the north star. And off to the right is the Little Dipper. Way down here at the bottom in the northwestern sky is the zigzag or the W of Cassiopeia. Here's a fun project for you, the next clear night. You see that star in the bend of the handle right there? It looks like a single star right off, but if you look closely, you will see it's actually two stars. The brighter one is called Mizar, and the fainter one is called Alcor. They're actually a double star. And if your vision is reasonably good, you should be able to split that single star into two stars. Try it the next clear night, right there in the bend of the handle of the Big Dipper. Oh, look at here we are back to Boötes, the Herdsman constellation, and Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. Uh, let Arcturus be your guide. It's a very bright star twinkling away in the eastern sky as soon as it gets dark. And we wrap it up by looking south. And here's Leo, there's Regulus. There's the sickle, as it's called, or the lion's head, and here's the lion's tail. And right down there, little Corvus, the crow. And to his left is the bright star Spica. Spica is the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. I hope some of you get up early in the morning, occasionally, uh, so that you can see what's happening then. We have Venus in the evening sky, 
And in the morning sky, if you get up, my gosh, I hate to say it, but if you get up at five o'clock or thereabouts and you look towards the southeast, you will see the three bright dawn planets all in a row. Here's Jupiter, the brightest of the three, and the furthest one to the right as you face to the south, southeast. Saturn follows right behind it. There's Saturn. And then a little further back towards the east to the left is the planet Mars. A beautiful arrangement of planets. They'll be out all spring like that in the morning sky. Uh, all easy to see about an hour and a half or so before the sun comes up. Roughly five o'clock would be a good time to go out. Now, I want to alert you to an event happening, and I wonder, Jack, if you could take me back. All right, here we are. Hope you can see me again. And we'll go back to that other slide in just a minute. I just wanted to let you know there is actually still a human being back here. Uh, tonight, just by good fortune, there is a meteor shower that's happening called the Lyrid meteor shower. And the Lyrids are a shower that, uh, the reason why they're called the Lyrids is because they come from the constellation of Lyra, the harp. So the whatever constellation the meteors stream from, in your direction, that constellation is, or it's named after that constellation. So we have Perseus for the Perseids and so forth. Well, this evening, the Lyrid meteor shower is really the first shower we've had since early winter. And the Lyrids uh, only kick out about 10 to 20 meteors per hour. And they will stream from a point near this bright star, Vega, which you can also pronounce as Vega, Vega Vega, in the constellation of Lyra low in the eastern sky at around after 11 o'clock at night. Unfortunately, you have to stay up a little bit late for this one, but if it's clear, you can go out as early as 11 o'clock. You can lay out on a, I, what I love to do is I just get on a reclining chair and I pull up a nice big blanket or a sleeping bag and I just kick back and look up at the sky and you'll see occasional meteors flying here and there. If you trace back their trails, to where they began, if they point towards the star Vega, then you have just spotted one of the Lyrid meteor shower members. Again, 10 to 20 per hour after 11 p.m. up until dawn tomorrow, April 22nd. They'll also be active on the 23rd too and a little bit after that, but tonight's really the best night. And I think we're gonna switch back again so we can see that slide. There we are. So we have the Lyrids there, and I've got this set for 12.30 in the morning. You don't have to get up at 12.30, but I've got this set for 12.30. Uh, I've got a little simulation of how the meteors look, and there it is, that brilliant star Lyra. And this point here is called the Radiant, 10 to 15, 10 to 20 meteors per hour. Where do these things come from? What is the origin of these meteors? Just about every meteor you see in the sky comes from a comet. When a comet swings around the sun, it's heated by the sun and the ices that make up a comet. A comet is actually like this ball of ice about a mile across or so with lots of dust and little bits of rock embedded in it. And as it gets closer to the sun, the sun heats the comet, vaporizes the ice. And as the ice vaporizes, it releases dust. And the dust forms this beautiful glowing atmosphere around the comet. The comet's right there in the middle. You can't even see it. It's so tiny. This is called a coma. That's, a, that's spelled C-O-M-A. And the sun itself, sunlight itself, pushes the dust back behind the comet's head to form the beautiful tail, the thing that makes comets so spectacular and why I'm so crazy about comets, and maybe you are too. We'll talk about a bright comet in the coming weeks that will be visible next month in May. So here we have a comet, here we have material streaming out of the comet. With a Lyrid meteor shower, those little bits of dust that strike the atmosphere and create the meteors, what we see is these streaks of light, they once originated in a comet. And we actually know which comet. It's called Comet Thatcher a comet that was discovered back in 1861. That was the last time it was around. Every time it goes around the sun, it deposits more of this dust as a trail. And each April, 
the Earth swings through that trail as it orbits the sun, and those bits of dust strike the atmosphere, kind of like hitting a bunch of mosquitoes when you're driving in your car, a bunch of bugs, and they smash against the windows. Well, it smashes against the atmosphere, and they start to glow, and they create meteors. So that's really what you're seeing when you're out looking at a meteor shower, kind of bits and pieces of a comet. I want to alert you to another event, too. For those that have binoculars, possibly binoculars, you can see this, but definitely in a small telescope. On April 25th, which is Saturday, the moon, which will be a beautiful crescent, yes, it's returning again to the evening sky, and it's, to me, it's the most beautiful phase, a crescent. Uh, and you can see here, not just the crescent, look at this. First, let me tell you about this. There's the bright, that part of the moon is lit by the sun. That's the bright part, right? This whole area here, that dark part, but you can still kind of see it. It's sort of a spooky light. That is called the Earth-lit moon. And what it is, is the Earth is also reflecting sunlight. All the clouds and the oceans, and that's, that reflected light goes out into space. Some of it strikes the moon. And the moon reflects a little bit of that back to us. By the time it's reflected back to us, because it's twice reflected sunlight, it's very faint. But it outlines the rest of the moon in a ghostly way that's very beautiful. Well, anyway, you've got this thin crescent moon with lots of earth shine, and it's going to pass right next to and even cover up the star Epsilon in the constellation of Taurus the Bull, Epsilon Tauri. And that happens between 8.45 and 9 p.m. That's when the star will be gone for our region. Further south, it will miss that star, and the moon will glide to the right of it. So watch for that. And finally, while we talked this week about, and Jackie, you can take me back, while we talked this week about planispheres, which are a whole lot of fun, and they don't require batteries. One of the reasons I recommend having one around, and also the paper map. Apps are really the thing now in astronomy, as they are in so many other sciences and in so many, <laughs> everywhere in our life practically. And there is a wonderful app called Star Chart that I wanna tell you about, because I'd like for you to download this app called Star Chart, and we've got links for you to download. It's free, you can get it for iPhone, or you can get it for Android. I want you to play with it a little bit after you've downloaded it. It looks like this. Let's see if I can get my phone to show you. By the way, for being free software, it doesn't pester you a lot to do things or buy anything else. So that's another advantage of it. So we're gonna show you this, let's see, I'll tip it this way. But you can see that where you point it, I'm gonna grab the screen, I can move it around, I can show you where the sun is, where the constellations are, where the planets are right now at this very moment if I want. But what's very cool about it is all you need is to hold it up to the sky. And it will tell you, it will show you exactly what stars and constellations are above you. And if you tap on one of those stars, it will give you information. Now there's lots more about this that I'll share next week. For now, just like for you to download it, play with it, and then we'll get to learn to use the app so that you'll have that choice too, which is an excellent choice. I wanna tell you one of the reasons why it's better than any planisphere is because the planisphere, while it includes all of the stars that you can see, and that's wonderful, the planisphere cannot tell you where the planets are, right? Because the planets are always in motion. Because they're in motion, we can't put them anywhere on this map because they will have moved. In fact, they always follow this line. You see that gray band there? That's called the ecliptic. The app, on the other hand, shows the planets exactly where they are every second of the day. This year, next year, 5,000 years in the future, way into the past. So we'll use that and have some fun with it. Now I wanna uh, finish up with one more photo. I'd like to share just a beautiful image or something that really struck me this week that's especially beautiful or interesting uh, before we go to any questions that you might have. So we'll click back. 
And once again, this is the app. This is someone here in Duluth using the app. Just download it and we're good for next week. We'll go over that. Plus we've got some exciting events for next week as well. This is a photo I wanted to share with you though. Look at that. I bet you could, you could guess where that was taken, right? From orbit. That, was a, that is a picture of our planet at night. You can see the clouds taken from the Southern Ocean, which borders Antarctica. And what you're looking at is the Southern Lights through the window of the International Space Station. Isn't that spectacular? It's gorgeous. You know, that very night that this was taken, which was April 10th or 13th, we had the Northern Lights here in our region. Not a big display, just a band low above the horizon. But how cool to think that somebody in the space station was seeing it at almost the same time, but the southern variety, because they happen at the same time. They're not identical, but they're very similar. So there you are from 250 miles up back a few days ago, not too far from the continent of Antarctica. And Jackie, you can take me back again. So those are a few things. I think you'll have fun playing with the app, download and print out that nice little star map. Go out at night. If you don't have a flashlight, don't worry about it too much. Uh, just put a regular light on it until you can get something red to shine. And uh, we'll see where we go from there. And I'm open right now to any questions that you might have. We have a question asking where the directions are so that they can find the meteor shower and view it. That's a good question. Uh, the, the, what's fascinating about meteor showers, you're not going to believe me, but it doesn't matter where you look to see a meteor shower. The meteors radiate appear to come from the direction of the bright star Vega, but they will appear all over the sky. I still have a preferred direction though. If it's clear here tonight, I like to take my lawn chair and point it so that I'm facing towards the southeastern sky with that streaming point off to one side. That way, meteors, you'll get a variety of meteors. You get the ones that are coming almost straight at you off to your side, and then you'll get to see the ones streaming, making long trails as they come off to the right and left of you. So I would say any direction, but if you want to pick one, east or southeast would be perfect. And give it an hour. Uh, you have to, first of all, have enough time to dark adapt your eyes. That takes about 15 minutes before you can really see the stars well. And then give it an hour, because during a meteor shower, there'll be like these gaps of three minutes, two minutes where nothing happens. And you think, oh, it's all over. I'm out of here. Don't. Just stick around. And you'll sometimes get two at a time or three at a time. The lyrids are known for fireballs, too. They can be unusually bright. I want to tell you, you see a fireball. It's all you need to see. Just one is enough. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? We have another one about the meteor shower. Somebody asking if they can see them from New York City. Oh, Oh my gosh. I wish you could. That is going to be tough. If they've turned off a lot of the lights there, I... You might be able to see a few, but it's, it'll be a struggle in New York City, I'm afraid. Uh, even I, in Duluth, I have to take a car and drive out of town for some things because there's light pollution here as well. And in New York City, lots of light pollution. If you can get out of the city to a more rural area where you can have a nice view to the north or east, go for it. Then you'll see a trickle, a few lyrics at least, I think, as long as you have clear skies. All right, thanks, Bob. The next question, um, asking if you could recommend a good resource for, I think, ast it says asterisms, is that asteroids? Oh, asterisms. Uh, yeah, a good resource for, and that's nice that we, uh, we have a viewer who is interested in asterisms. I love asterisms. What are these things? They are, the Big Dipper is an asterism. In other words, it's not even a constellation, believe it or not. The Big Dipper is the brightest part of the constellation of the Great Bear called Ursa Major. So these bright pieces of constellations are called asterisms. The Belt of Orion is an asterism. Even the W of Cassiopeia 
is an asterism. They're a simple way to kind of get hooked into a constellation so that you can work your way from the bright part to the fainter parts and see the entire constellation. The question was, good resources for asterism. I don't know of any book for asterisms, but I know that uh, there are asterism websites. So if you were to type in asterism, and actually I've done a couple of articles about them. If you type in asterism and Astro Bob, you'll probably find some more resources there. Thank you for the question. All right, another question. Um, it says, I've noticed how bright Arcturus is in the southern sky in the evening, almost like a planet, although not bright as Venus in the western sky. Is it always this bright? Yes, Arcturus is always reliably bright like that. As a matter of fact, all the bright stars that we see, with one or two exceptions, are, they maintain their same brilliance no matter what. Of course, most star or all stars are brighter the higher up they get because we look at them through less of the atmosphere. It's not when you look at a star when it's really low, you're looking at it through dust, humidity, a lot of air. Once it gets higher, then it looks brighter. But yes, Arcturus, heck, that star is so bright. I believe it's the sixth brightest. That is always brilliant, just about unless it's near the horizon. Right now, I don't see any more questions, but maybe, Bob, you'd like to give us an introduction to what you're going to be talking about the next two sessions. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat session. Well, I know for sure that the next time that we get together, uh, I'll be talking about a really interesting topic, a brand new thing that's happening uh, with a group of satellites called Starlink satellites that are being launched in the process of being launched by SpaceX. And the Starlinks will form this vast net, ultimately when all of them are launched, you're not gonna believe this, it's 12,000 of them all together. Uh, when all of them are in orbit, they will be used to provide internet access across the planet, anywhere, to subscribers. So it doesn't matter where you're at, most remote places will have internet access. Of course, that takes 12,000 satellites. Right now, there are 360 of them up there. Another 60 will be launched tomorrow on the 22nd in the afternoon. So that'll bring it up above 400. So we're gonna talk about what's happening with these satellites, how they affect astronomy, and also, especially most important, is how you can see these because they are like nothing in the sky. They form like strings, like popcorn strings, one after another of bright lights in a row. Maybe some of you have already seen these and wondered what the heck was going on. So that is something that we'll discuss. We'll also talk about, again, how to use that app and get the most out of it. All right, we have another question. It says, will Starlink interfere with space travel or night sky viewing? Uh, it's not expected, wonderful question, not expected to interfere with space travel, but well, it does make you wonder though, but it will interfere with professional astronomy potentially because you will have all of these lights crawling across your field of view when you're trying to take photographs. Some of us, and I'm included in this, are concerned that having 12,000 satellites in addition to all the other ones that are up there presently, having that many satellites moving across the night sky outnumbers how many stars you can actually see. By the way, you can only see about 9,800 stars across the planet at any time, 9,800. If we have that many satellites, the concern is that the natural appearance of the night sky will be changed. And I'm afraid some of us are concerned that we want it to remain as wild as possible and not always be seeing satellites traveling through the night. We have a couple more questions coming in. Mm -hmm. All right, next one says, while sweeping under Canis Major with my telescope, I saw an asterism. I like to call copycat dipper. Have you seen it? The star oh. HD 58394 is one of the stars from it. I have never seen the copycat dipper. Wonderful. I, and of course, what uh, this uh, person is talking about is a telescopic asterism. There are asterisms that we can see with our eyes, naked eye ones, like the belt of Orion and so on. But 
if you think there are a bunch of those through the telescope, there are dozens and dozens and dozens more of them. So they're really a lot of fun. I think we as people enjoy making patterns and constructing patterns. And so whoever this person is, congratulations for making your own asterism. I love it. There are lots of those. I make them all the time in my telescope when I'm trying to find an object. If I'm hopping to a galaxy from one to the next, I make my own little asterisms to kind of remember my way. So pattern making is an important thing. And it's just part of uh, being human to see wonderful patterns in the sky. My gosh, that's how we got the constellations in the first place, right? And it looks like the last question here. Oh, no, we got another one coming in after it. All right, next question. Bob, what is your favorite star? <laughs> but that's, a, that's, a, that's like a really hard question. Thank you for asking it, though. My favorite star. Well, I'm going to have to do my seasonal favorite, okay? One of my very favorite stars is Betelgeuse. All right, I like the name. Who doesn't like the name Betelgeuse in Orion? Betelgeuse is one of the brightest stars in Orion. It has a wonderful color. It's also a variable star. And this past season, this star did just something totally amazing. It's, it changes light anyway. It, it kind of puffs in and out. It gets brighter and fainter. But this past season, it went from being bright to extremely faint, fainter than it ever had been. It was like, what happened to Betelgeuse? People thought maybe you know, it was going to blow up as a supernova. Never happened. Then, in a matter of weeks, once it bottomed out, Betelgeuse shot back up, and now it's bright again. And I saw this. Those who were uh, looking at it saw this with their own eyes, just in a matter of weeks. I think that was amazing. So two thumbs for Betelgeuse for me. All right, Bob. We're still having a few more questions coming in, but maybe we should hold those until our next session. And... We'll go ahead and wrap up tonight, unless there's anything else that you'd like to share with the group. Uh, well, I just hope that you have clear skies. Don't lose hope if it's cloudy. One thing about astronomy that I've learned over the years is that <clears throat> just about everything repeats in the sky. So if you miss something, don't get too concerned about it. It's going to happen again. You'll have another opportunity. And if you're out, for instance, for this meteor shower, and you don't see many meteors, at least you are out there under those stars. And I can't think of anything more relaxing and sort of mind freeing than laying out under the stars and letting anything happen above you. It's a great way to enjoy an evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Bob. This has been great. We've learned a lot tonight. And I know all of us here at VMPA are looking forward to our next sessions. We'll, we will have two more sessions with Bob on viewing the night skies. Same time, same place for the next two Thursdays, starting at four o'clock in the afternoon. And he will continue on. He gave you a little bit of information about what we will be doing the next time. And as we mentioned, that you can go to the voyagers.org slash dark skies to find some of the resources that Bob mentioned. And if we didn't get to your question this time, please join us again and we'll bring them up to Bob. And if you have questions in between these sessions, feel free to keep track of them and we can ask them next time. So thanks again to all of you for joining us and thank you, Bob. It's been great. Thank you very much.